Hey, good morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Mike, and I'm the lead minister here at Southeast. And we're in a sermon series going through uh, the first couple chapters of Genesis. And I feel that this is a very important sermon series, not because of the series, but because of the text. Uh, because I believe that as uh, the Israelites were being brought into the promised land, they were uh, in slavery for 400 years in Egypt, and they cried out to God, and God hear, heard their cries, and he freed them, he rescued them. And so as they're moving into the promised land, God gives them Moses, the prophet, the Moses, Moses and he gives them uh, the Ten Commandments and the law and, and all this stuff, and Genesis is part of that. And I think what he was doing was he was establishing, hey, if I'm going to be your God and and you're going to be my people, here are some core truths that you and I need to understand. Here here are some things that, that as you're going into this new land, you need to understand that there's not other gods out there. You were in Egypt. They they worshiped. They worshiped the sun. I created the sun. I spoke and things came into existence. And, and I feel that whenever we kind of get off path in our own lives, I think that it's helpful for us to kind of come back to these core truths. So maybe you're going through a season where, where you went to the doctor and you heard some news that you weren't expecting. I think it's good to kind of step back and get into the foundational things that you and I believe if we believe that, you know, if we, if we believe in this. I, I think that if you're having difficulty in your marriage, I think it's good to stop and pause and just kind of back up and breathe and look at these core truths. I think whatever season that you are in, it's good to just pause and look at these things. And so the first week we looked at creation, and creation was this this moment where God spoke and things came into existence. And we see a couple truths out of it. So one is that God is utterly other than us. You and I are not God. He is God. And, And another thing is that the Spirit hovers over creation. And, and I believe that this is why, you know, as we head into the fall and the, the stormy weather that I love, I don't know, we're getting into chilly season, which is fantastic. But I believe that when you're up there on the slopes and you're coming down the mountain and you feel that presence, I think that's him. I think that's him. And I also think that God still works through his word. And so there's this chaos that, that we recognize in creation that God spoke. So God brings uh, chaos to order. And then we looked and we said that God, God created this thing and we are supposed to be stewards over it. That, that you and I are partakers with him in creation. Like this is pretty amazing that, that he didn't just create, walk away. He said, no, he wants to do life with us. And, and we looked and we thought, we, we saw some things that if you and I are going to be fulfilled in our work, in our vocation, as we're stewarding over, there's ways that God works in us. One is that he has created you to do something. You're wired to do things. And, and, and I'm wired to do things. That you are uniquely gifted in, in certain ways. And the other thing is that it needs to be for community. It needs not, to not just be for you. It needs to be for community. And, and so we look at that. And then last week we looked at this one. And this one is, is a big one. Because I don't think that we realize this is that when God created and he put Adam in the garden, like everything was perfect. I mean, there there was no sin. He had the best food. He had the best, you know, I mean, it was was just magnificent. It was the garden. It was Eden. And yet there was something lacking. And when you look at this, this relationship of creation between God, the Spirit, and Jesus, the Trinity, three in one, he, he sees this. We see him kind of expanding that circle to include you and me. But what's amazing about it is he looks at Adam and he says, hey, you're not complete. You're not complete. And he, he creates woman um, as, and he says helper. And I just want to tell you that helper word is used of the Holy Spirit. So that's not to diminish, but that is actually to elevate women in our culture. And oftentimes that gets forgotten. And the reason that he did it is because we were intended to have relationship. You and I, we were made for relationship. So here's the problem. Here's the problem. You look around and you're like, well, this is fantastic, but I don't see it. I mean, I, mean, I, look, at the, I look at creation and it, it doesn't look good to me. I mean, we have hurricanes coming off the coast of Florida. We have earthquakes across the world. We have, you know, this, this global warming thing. Like, we, we, like I, we just don't see it. Like, you're telling me that creation is good, Mike, but, but look at all of this. 
And on top of that, you, you look at vocation and you look at these things and it's like, uh, you know, I see people taking advantage of other people. You know, I, I go into another part of the world and they're making 10 cents a day and I'm over here like, how do you how do you reconcile that, Mike? How do you how do you reconcile that as we're supposed to be stewarding, stewarding creation uh, that I don't see a lot of stewardship going on. I see a lot of people taking advantage of other people. And that lends itself right into the next one, because when I look at relationships, I just see brokenness all around. I, I see husbands and wives not communicating. I see all these different things, you know, I, I'm g- going through a divorce or going through, you know, some sort of things where kids don't talk to the parents. Like, Mike, you're telling me that all this stuff was good. And, and I look around and I don't see it. I see the brokenness in this world. I see the brokenness um, in, in our communities. And I see the brokenness in relationships. So, so tell me what happened. Because sometimes that gets so dark that it's palpable. You can taste it. And, and not only taste it, that I think that if we're honest, if we're honest and we look at this and we go, yes, I want that, I want that, I want that, I, I look at that moment and we say, yes, I want healthy relationship. I want to say that creation is good. And yet it goes deeper than that, Mike, because I find that my own desires are contrary to what I see as good. My own desires are broken. It's not just that we live in a broken world and that people are broken around us and that I've done some things I shouldn't have and I don't do the things that I should have. It runs deeper in my soul than simply we live in a broken world. It's that I see the goodness that that God describes and I want to say that I want that all of the time, but I don't. don't. So what happened? And if you have your Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter three, because this is it. This is the fall. So God created them, Adam and Eve. They had everything that they could have ever wanted. (laughs) And God puts them in this garden and he says, hey, here's the deal. I, I need you to do one thing. Just don't eat from the tree. Just don't eat from the tree. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. You're going to steward the the ground. You're going to take care of the animals. You're going to have this incredible relationship between a husband and a wife, Adam and Eve. Just here's the thing. Just trust me and and I will take care of you. And and how does God know that? Like, how does he know that they're going to trust him? Because he didn't make him robots. He says, here's the deal. I'm going to, to show that I'm, that you trust me. I'm just going to put this tree in the garden. Just don't eat it. Everything else you can have. Everything else is on limits. This, though, is off limits. Just don't, just don't eat it. And Adam and Eve, they, they, you know, we don't know how long this was. Again, you know, we kind of flipped the chapters. We don't know if this was a week, if this was a month, or if this was you know, a couple of years. We have no idea. But what we do know is this moment here. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did... Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And when the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now, here's the thing, and I don't know the answer to this. I don't know if we're going to know the answer to this. God gave Adam that instruction before Eve was created. And the instruction was, you're not supposed to eat of the tree. And, and what she does here is when she's repeating back to the serpent the instruction, it was, you're not even supposed to touch the tree. And from what we see in the, in the, in the previous chapter, in chapter 2, it says, no, you can't eat it. So, so as far as we know, it appears that if, if it was a good climbing tree, they were more than welcome to go and climb in this tree. But what Eve said here, and it could be one of, I, one of a couple things. One is this, Adam could have just not given the full instruction to Eve. I mean, that's a possibility. It, he could have just been like, hey, don't, don't touch the tree. And, and he didn't go into all this stuff. Could, that's one possibility. We, we just don't know. The, the other thing that could have happened, and I think that this is very likely, is that we create a hedge around things. 
And, and we do this today. It's, it's, you know, don't go to that. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, um, I remember when we were in youth ministry, we were taking kids down to camp in Arizona. And we had junior hires and high schoolers, and it was a great time, uh, UCYC, great camp. And we would go down there, and one, one year we thought, you know what, let's, let's stop and take the kids to the Grand Canyon. And so we were on a planning trip, and we stopped at the Grand Canyon, and we thought, this is fantastic for us, the adults. I don't know about having junior hires around this cliff that can plummet them to their desks would be a good idea. I think parents might get a little upset at that. And so we didn't go. Because we just, it was just too close. And, and I'm that way. And you guys are looking at me now like, Mike, you are too close to the stage. You should probably have that table back in front just in case you fall off. If only there was a hedge. And, and that's, I, I, we don't know. That could have been what Adam was doing with Eve. That could have been what they both did. They, were, you know, they both sat down for dinner and they were like, you know what? Why don't we just not touch the tree? Let's not go near it. Let's just put a hedge around because then that way if we accidentally, you know, if we're walking down the road and we fall into the tree, we're still okay because we just broke the hedge. We didn't actually eat from the fruit. So we don't know, but there was some sort of miscommunication in what God had spoken and what they told each other and what they believed. And so as they're, as they're going along, here's what the serpent then says. He says this in verse 4. He says, but the serpent said to the woman, you, you will not surely die. You won't die. That's, that's ridiculous. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know what the serpent didn't do? The serpent didn't attack the existence of God. The, 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 the serpent then, what he did is he created this atmosphere of just simply, that's ridiculous. You, you got to be kidding. <laughs> There's no way that God said, God doesn't want you either the truth. You're not going to die. In fact, actually, you will become like God. Knowing good and evil. You will become like God, knowing good and evil. You see, uh, the issue is not the fruit of, of the tree. That, that's not the issue. Uh, sometimes we, we, we try to figure out, like, well, I wonder what it is. And some people think it's an apple. That's what's usually depicted in, in pictures. I've heard a lot of people land on pomegranates. Personally, I think it was a banana. But we have no clue as to what it could be. But it really doesn't matter. Because the issue was not that they were eating the tree. The issue was that they were not willing to trust God for what he said he would do. His provision. And what the serpent did is he created an atmosphere of distrust with God. Saying, you know what? He doesn't really care about you. He's holding out on you. He knows that if you have that, you're going to become like God. Don't you understand? Life could be so much better if you could just follow your passions, your desires. I mean, after all, like you were made that way. You have these desires. God doesn't make mistakes. He's just holding out on you. Just run. Just do whatever makes you feel good. You see what he was doing? It was an atmosphere of distrust with God. Surely God doesn't know what's best for you. Surely God doesn't care about you. If God cared about you, he would let you run full throttle and eat from the tree. And again, we don't know how much time. We don't know when that lie was whispered, if it was at that moment that they reached out and they grabbed the tree or grabbed the fruit. We don't know if it was just simply that, that little lie that just kind of sat, kind of sunk deep into their heart. And it could have been 30 minutes. It could have been a week. It could have been years. But at some point, they said, you know what? I can't live like this anymore. I believe that God is holding out on me. So when the woman saw that the, tree was good, that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of it 
She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. You see, what's interesting about this to me is that Notice what God didn't do. He didn't, he didn't put them in the garden and say, you know what? Don't lie to each other. He, he didn't put them in the garden and, and, and say, hey, don't take advantage of each other. God put them in a garden with something that is good. No, notice what it was. it was. It was pleasing to the eyes and, and it would make them know the good and evil. Like it was a good thing. But it came down to is, are they going to trust me? It came down to, are you willing to to give this up to know that I'm going to take care of everything that you need? And honestly, most most of the stuff that you and I get into trouble with are not the things where we're, we're the things that are off limits. Most of the time, most of the time that you and I, we get into trouble it's things that are good, and we've gone and we've taken them outside the, the boundaries that God has given to us. So, for example, when you, when you look and you, and you recognize like, that God created and everything was good, think about this. Think about your relationship with food. God, God gave you taste buds to be able to taste different things, to experience the joy and the pleasure of food. And what have we gotten and done? We've used it as medication to eat our feelings away. Think about this. Think about this. God gave us the pleasure of sex. And, and what have we done? We've, we've taken that and we've, we've moved it outside of the boundaries of a husband and wife. You see, that's what we do is we take these good things that God has entrusted with and we Break them. And immediately when they did that, and I, I think you and I feel the same thing, is we knew we, we kind of got to hide. Because it, it messes with our souls. We, we know what we should do, and we don't do it. We know what we shouldn't do, and we do it anyway. Right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so what did, what did they do? They sewed fig leaves to hide themselves. They were naked and they were ashamed. And so there was this moment, and I, I love this. Verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? I love that line. I always chuckle when I hear that line. Two naked people. I left them right here. Where did they go? God knew. But God searched him out. And, and I love that. Because wherever you are, on your spiritual journey, I promise you that God is looking for you and seeking you and giving you an opportunity, just as he gave Adam and Eve an opportunity to come to him and to confess. God, we did this. But the key thing here that we, you and I recognize is that what they used to have this incredible, awesome, perfect prayer life. And when they sinned, it, it broke that prayer life. To the point now where they said, you know what? I, I don't want to be with him. He's going to be ashamed of me. He's going to, gosh, can you imagine what God would, would say? And we see this deep thing that runs through Adam and Eve is that when they sin, when they, when they said, God, I'm not going to trust you. It broke their relationship with him. But it goes deeper than that. Look at what happens then in verse 10. And he said, I heard the sound of you. This is Adam. I, I heard the, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, 
and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? So he's hiding. He said, hey, we ate of the tree. Who did this? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, what is that that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. You see, what happened here is that immediately their relationship with God was broken. Like, oh, we got to hide ourselves now. We got to put fig leaves on. But then it ran deeper than that because it actually broke their relationship with, other, with each other. All of a sudden, it was this blame shifting thing that happened. God comes to Adam and says, hey, what have you done? Well, actually, uh, she did it. It wasn't my fault. And actually, God, like if I back up and I look at it, it's really your fault because you gave her to me. Eve says, no, it wasn't me, it was the serpent. You see, and that's the issue. When we look at creation and we see that how God created and it was good, and we look at our vocation and the stewardship that we're supposed to have over creation, and we say that it was good, and we look at our relationships and Adam and Eve, and we, and we say, oh, it was good, it was very good after he completed that step. And we look around and we say, well, what happened, God? How does this, how does this even happen? Because I look at it and it it's right here. It's because you and I have sinned. And it's in that moment of sin that it breaks our relationship with God and it breaks our relationship with each other. And so God being a good God, because he loves his people, he cannot let sin go unpunished. He has to punish sin. He can't look at injustice and not do anything about it. If he were to look at injustice and not do anything about it, we would say that you are not justice and you are not love. But because he is justice and he, he is love, he has to do something about sin. And so what happens here, and there he turns to the serpent. And I love this. If you have your Bible, if you have your Bible, you need to underline these next few verses. In verse 14, he says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above all the beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And here it is, verse 15. This is the first gospel message, the first euangelion. This is the promise. Look at what he says. He says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's looking at the serpent and he's saying, look, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. There's going to be strife between you and her and between your offspring and her offspring. You're, you're, there's going to be this enmity between the two of you. There's going to be this battle. There's going to be this strife. There's going to be this tension. But ultimately what's going to happen, ultimately what's going to happen is this. And her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And that word is actually crush. Is that you're actually going to crush his heel. So she's going to have a child. She's going to have an offspring. And it's going to look like you're going to win. You're going to, you're going to crush his heel. But ultimately, he's going, to, he's going to crush your head. He's going to destroy you. Now, you and I, we know the answer to the story, right? Like this is the story of the Bible. It's this promise. And if you want to know like the story of the Bible, you just follow this promise along. You watch this promise turn into a family, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the rest of Genesis. We watch it turn into a nation, the nation of Israel. We watch it culminate in Christ, and then Christ inaugurates his kingdom. When you and I surrender our lives to Christ and say, hey, yes, Lord, I need a savior. Yes, Lord, I am a sinner. Yes, Lord, I need to accept your forgiveness. You and I are born into that family. Through that seed. We're part of that promise. But she didn't know that. She just knew at some point she's going to have a child. And ultimately that child is going to destroy Satan. It's going to destroy the serpent. That's the promise. Satan knows that there's going to be this, this tension between him and Eve. 
there's this tension, you know, at first when the serpent came to Eve, she was willing to listen. I don't think she's willing to listen anymore. And then we see generation after generation after generation, there's this spiritual battle going on. You feel it in your homes, you feel it in your offices, you feel it in our country. You, you and I, it, it, that spiritual battle is palpable. We can taste it, we can feel it. But ultimately, this spiritual battle is going to culminate with the death and destruction of Satan and death. And then he goes on and he turns from the serpent and he looks at Eve. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. And pain you shall bring forth children. I'm not going to comment. It's just wise for me not to. But look at what she says. Here. Look at what he says here. Your desire. Shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. All of a sudden, that, that relationship is broken. That helper, that equal status, that, that desire to, to be husband and wife, there's something that happens in our relationship. And that word desire is actually used two other times in Scripture, once in the Song of Solomon, but it seems to have a different context. The other time it's used in just the next chapter, which we'll talk about next week, is when Cain kills Abel. So this is your desire will be for your husband. When, when God is talking to Cain and he says, your desire for sin is when you killed Abel. Husbands, this is why your wife wants to kill you all the time. It's right there. But men, you and I aren't off the hook. Because we have this upside down relationship with husband and wife and it's not working. It never works. You know, it's just kind of broken. And, it's, and instead of being this incredible relationship that God intended in the beginning, it becomes kind of this other thing. But then he looks at Adam. And when he looks at Adam, this is what he says. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, into dust you shall return. All of a sudden now, this creation that, that they were supposed to be stewarding is now not going to be easy for them. Now it's not going to produce as, as God had intended to. it. Now it's going to be by the sweat of his brow that he needs to work the ground. The other day, you know, you guys know that Jamie and I, well, Jamie's getting better I am not very good at plants. I spent a couple hours weeding our garden the other day. And I, the whole time I'm just thinking, come on, Adam. <laughs> Seriously. People, and, and you know this, people spend thousands of dollars to manicure their, their lawns. You know how much money you have to spend to grow weed? Nothing. It's just what the ground does now. And so we see this when, when Adam and Eve sinned, everything, everything broke. We have this spiritual brokenness now. We have this relational brokenness now. And we have this physical brokenness as well. But through it all, and I love this one, <laughs> this one verse in this passage. It's 315, but, but this, next, this next verse after that. Look at what it says. We have that promise in 315, but look at this. In verse 20, look at how powerful this is. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. What a statement of faith. In that moment that they sinned, that they looked at God and they said, they looked at the tree, they looked at God, they had the conversation with the serpent and they said, God, we don't trust you. 
We think you're holding out on us. We think that we could become like you. We, we have all, all of a sudden, and, and they ate, and, and obviously their, their whole world came crashing down. And God comes in and he, he gives them this one promise that her offspring, that her offspring will overcome the evils of this world. That her offspring will, will redeem everything. This one promise. So as they're there and they're facing death, Adam looks up at God and says, this time I trust you. This time I trust you. And he looks at Eve and, I'm gonna, I'm, and he, he says, I'm going to call you living. Not because of what you and I have done, but because of the promise that God is going to work in and through you. What a statement of faith. What a reversal. And, and I think that happens with all of us. In verse 21, he says, And then, and the Lord God made Adam and Eve, and Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. It, this was to show that there had to be a consequence for their sin. This was introducing that when you and I sin, there is a death that needs to take place. There is something that happens. It doesn't just. And, and so God kills the animals and he clothes them. He, they can get rid of the fig leaves. They can get rid of all that stuff. And, you know, and I, as I think about that, as you and I, as we make, as we sin, as we do things we shouldn't do, as we don't do things we ought to do, we try to cover that up. And sometimes we try to cover that up with rules and religion, and we try to cover that up with regulation, and we just kind of say, okay, God, I don't do that, but if I just do this, and you know, if I, de- if I dress the right way, if I speak the right things, if I eat the right foods, if I do all those things, then God, you will accept me. And it's kind of like the fig skins that we hear, the fig leaves that we put on ourselves. We just try to cover ourselves up with religion. Or we go the other way, and it's kind of this irreligion thing, and we just say, you know what, if God's a God of love, then he's going to accept everybody, and blah, 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 and we kind of have our own little set of rules that everybody else must follow. And we kind of go, well, if I accept them, then God would accept me type thing. And, and, we, and again, it's just the same thing. It's using ourselves as our own savior, and it's using these fig leaves. And God comes and says, no, 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 you don't have to hide anymore. I'm going to provide the garment for you. And that's what Adam saw. He saw, despite all the pain, despite all the brokenness, despite all that stuff, I'm going to believe God. Because God keeps his promises. And so as I was thinking about this, I I kind of came up with a couple things that I wanted to share with you. God keeps his promises. Here's the first one is this. There is life in Christ. As you're looking at this world and you're seeing the brokenness of it, again, whether it's the spiritual brokenness that you're looking at, the physical brokenness of this world, or the brokenness in our relationships, there is life in Christ. In, in Colossians, in, or in, yeah, in Colossians 2, 13 through 15, he says this. He says this, and you who are dead in your trespass and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to a cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. It's this promise that, that, that ultimately her, her seed who is fulfilled in Jesus, he gives us life. There is life in Christ. It's interesting to me, just one of the small little correlations between this, that, that Adam and Eve, they were, they were taken away from the, the, the tree of life. And, and ultimately, like one of the cool things about the Bible is that it ends with this in Revelation chapter 22, ch- chapters 21 and 22. That, that we get to partake of the tree of life again. But it's also we see that, that Jesus climbed the tree. And he is our life. He went to the cross for us. In exchange for us. He says, Adam and Eve, you don't have to pay the consequence. I will pay the consequence for you. 
Here's the other one, though, is this. God keeps his promises. There is life in Christ. God keeps his promises. There is healing for relationships. And it's through Christ. And the Bible tells us that in our relationships with, with the husband and wife, that we're supposed to have this posture of, of the church, of Jesus and the church. So, so just as Christ died for the church, I'm supposed to die to my wife. And just as the, wife, just as the church submits to uh, Christ, the, our wives are supposed to submit to us. It's, it's this posture, it's this continual, I'm going to die, she's going to submit. I'm going to die, she's going to submit. I'm going to die, submit. It's this mutual submission to each other. And, and he gives us this ingredients. And in Ephesians chapter 5, he says this, as we look at that passage in Genesis chapter 3, here's how you overcome that through Christ. Here's the line. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Like this is the key to, to, to a healthy marriage. And, and this is the key for, for that, re, that reversal of that, that domineering spirit that happens. Now, here's the deal. I, I know what some of you are thinking because I've been there. And you walk away, and if you're a guy, if you're a guy, you, you walk away and you go, well, she doesn't respect me. Everything that I do, it just, you know, I try to suggest something, and she, she doesn't want to do it. And so you know what? After, after hearing no so many times, so many times, so many times, I'm just going to back away. And, and we just kind of walk away from our responsibility. And, and, and women, you, you do the same thing. He's not loving me. He's not loving me. He's not loving me. He's not loving me. And eventually, it just kind of creates this separation, this barrier that you just can't seem to, to overcome. And oftentimes what happens then is, is we just look at it, we just keep pointing back at each other. And I just want to encourage you that this passage is not supposed to be used as a hammer to hit other people with. Here's my question for you guys. Are you, you know, look at this. Look at the last part of that passage in Genesis chapter 3 where it talks about the ground and the hard work and everything that it takes. Oftentimes, we don't deserve respect, to be honest with you. Because you and I go and do hard things and it's like, ah, that's hard. I don't want to do it. So the question that I would ask you, if you're, if you're a man and you're, you're in that relationship and it's, and you're like, my wife is not respecting me. Here's my first question to you. Are you doing things that are respectable? I mean, are, are, you, are you sitting on the couch, sleeping away the day, you know, and staying up all night playing video games and looking at porn? I don't blame her for not respecting you. It should be a mirror. It, 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 as we look at this passage, it should be like, am I doing things in such a way that my wife cannot help but respect me just because of the way that I'm living my life. And for the woman, it's the same question. It's not a hammer, it's a mirror. Do I make my husband, is it easy for him to love me? Or do I make it difficult? And I know there's some of you that are in here and you're just like, ah, oh, man, that's great for husbands and wives and you know, I've been through divorce or I'm not married yet and I've gone through that. Here, here it is in another way. Another passage says this. Look at, look at this passage um, in Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You say, I'm single? Great, here's a passage for you. Now, now here's the thing. I, I'm here to tell you, like, I think, I think I'm pretty good at serving other people, in my humble but accurate opinion. Um, you know what stings with this verse? It's not the serving part. Honestly, like, I think that we can do that pretty well. In fact... Um, the younger generation is known for serving people. Like that, that's just, you have, you have the builders and you have Gen X and the next generations after them. Like I said, we have drilled it into those younger generations. You got to serve people. 
And, and they're wired that way to serve. You know, and, and we see it. Like, you, you do a service project, and people, like, show up, and, like, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's cool. You, you know what the part that stings, though? Count others more significant than yourself. That's the hard part. Because oftentimes when we serve other people, we look at it and we say, hey, I'm serving you. How good am I? And rather than taking a posture of humility, we take a posture of pride. You want to reverse the curse? It's right here. Here's another one, though. God keeps his promise. Everybody is invited. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. I, I love this passage. I'll tell you what. In, in the Bible, in the New Testament, there are Paul, Paul Peter, James. They, they kind of all go through these lists. And they're all kind of unique. So we know it's not like exhaustive, but it's just he's saying a point. And, and his point was in this moment of everybody is invited. He's saying, look, remember, you surrendered your life to Christ. These are the things that you used to do. And, and these are the things that you are now in Christ. And, and I love this passage for one particular line. Look at this. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, it says this. Go back, go back. Then I saw a new heaven. No, right there. Or do you not know? that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greeter, greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will, will inherit the kingdom of God. There's another place where it talks about, and such things. So this list is not exhaustive. This list is, you were dead in your trespasses, and then God came and made you alive in him. And here's the line. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. That's the gift. You see, you and I, we all ended up into this broken world. We, we, we got into the broken world and we've experienced brokenness and, and it, we've experienced in just the physical world. Things break down. Things don't go the way as they should. We, we experience in the spiritual world where we just feel lost and broken and lonely and scared and frightened and anxious and depressed. We experience all of that. And all of that causes us to do things. They're not, they're not taking responsibility for ourselves, but we listen to those voices. We listen to those things and we move and we start moving in a direction that is contrary to God. But then Jesus comes in. He says, as such were some of you. As such were some of you. And he looks at this and says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. And you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, you were living as the world lives. But now you've been saved. Now you've been redeemed. Now you have been made alive in Christ. Now you have been given hope. Here's the final thing. Because you know what? I, I just get tired sometimes. And I, I don't know, maybe you get tired too. Is that you just start looking out at things and it's just you're, you're tired because, again, you get to this point where it's like, I know what is good. I know 
what God has for me. I know these things and I want to step in line with the gospel, but I am so tired of wrestling with my flesh. Has anybody ever felt that? Those moments where you come to worship and you, you sing songs and you look around and you see other people singing songs declaring that Christ is Lord, abiding in Him as we sang this morning. You see those things and it's like, yes, Lord, everything about it. And you open up Scripture and you, and, and you look at it and it's like this amazing thing where it's like it speaks to your soul, you know, just some of the songs you pull out. And it's... um. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you save, O Lord. And we cry out and we cling to that. And then in moments of weakness, You go out and you're driving down the highway and you flip somebody off. You go home after a long day of work and your kids say the wrong thing and you just go off on them. The temper wells up. You're, you're surrendering to him and then you find out tragically that one of your friends has passed away in a car accident. I think that we can hold on to these things, that, that Jesus gives life, that God keeps his promises, Jesus gives life, and, and we can hold on to that. We can hold on to that. Jesus is the restorer of relationships. We can hold on to that. We can hold on to that, that everybody's invited. But I also think that we have to hold on to this at some point. Death will be no more. Because God keeps his promises. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. Revelation, one of the pictures that we get is the sea. And the sea is the mass of people. It's the confusion. It's the darkness. It's the... It's the kingdoms of this world. It's the chaos. And so when he says the sea is no more, he says all of that chaos is not going to be there anymore. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, that's coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's the church. This chaos isn't going to be there anymore, but the church is there. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. God keeps his promises.